In order for man psychology to come into being for any particular man, there needs to be a death. Death, symbolic, psychological, or spiritual, is always a vital part of any initiatory ritual. In psychological terms, the boy ego must die. The old ways of being um, and thinking and feeling must ritually die before the new man can emerge. Welcome back to the Pop Ponder Potter. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to the Ponder Ponder Podcast. I'm your host of Ruben Gutierrez. And today we have another um, look into another book. So today we have The King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. Now this is a book that came um, across my mind or someone told me about it when I was about 22, so 10 years ago. And uh, I purchased the book, and ever since then, I've probably read it about six or seven times. And occasionally, I read it um, for thoughts and ideas. I have my notes, which we'll be going over today, um, that I use, actually. And there's parts that I highlight to make sure that I never forget these particular like rules and understanding now, a bit of background, a lot, I, mean, I am a very much a logical science C, I guess. That's not a word, but whatever. We'll, we'll go with it. A bit of a science person, logical. I like to think three things and think of all the uh, possibilities and, and things like that. I question everything, which is the, main, the biggest part of this show, right? Ponder, ponder, podcast. Um, and these books like this really make you think. What I love about books like this is that they have stories they use. This is um, Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette, or you know, if it's spelled just like the shaver for men. Anyway, um, so it, they're both uh, were trained under Carl Jung, um, Jung Jung, however you want to say it, and um, they have written other things, but this is probably their most famous books in the, in the men's work arena. Um, so they use a lot of stories, a lot of mythology, um, a lot of that because humanity over time, we, we couldn't, it's really hard to understand like a lot of the reasons why we're here and in terms of like earth, um, why we are born, why we have consciousness, all these things. And slowly science is starting to, to figure these things out. There's a lot of um, questions that come up when we discover new things about the brain or and things like that. So I love to think about mythology. I love stories. It's, it's very, very impactful for me. So this may get a little sp spiritual and woo woo. Um, so hope you are ready for that because there is a lot of conversation around these pieces. Um, just like what I started with. Now that quote about the Death, um, it's something that we all go through, right? If you're in a relationship, you break up, that's a death. If you, you know, leave the state and the place you grew up in, like, that's considered a death. It's very symbolic and spiritual. And when you go to a new area, it's like a rebirth. And I love this way of thinking. I think of um, the seasons that way, right? Like, when we go from summer to winter, there's a slow death happening. And then winter is... When you go through the death and spring is that rebirth um, and then you see life flourish and beauty comes out of the ground, right? The flowers and the butterflies come out and all these things. And then winter comes and there's a death again and they're both needed. Um, it's very important. Death is not bad. Unfortunately, um, westernized civilization have decided to like. Think of death as out there, right? Versus like back in the day, I mean, it was unfortunate. It was not a good place to be where you, death was pretty much everywhere, right? People would die and they would just throw bodies on the street. I mean, war and all these things, right? Um, so it's good that we have some kind of distance from that kind of death. But majority of Western eyes, like thought, is that we're pretty much invincible, and a lot of people live their lives that way, which is why I'm a big fan of Ryan Holiday, Stoic philosophy, and it's just like meditate on your death type of things. And when I make the decisions, it's like, well, one day I'm going to die and not be here. What can I do today? So with that being said, we're going to jump into it. 
And there's going to be parts to this. Um, <clears throat> and the first part is really about the boy psychology. And this is really um, geared towards men. But if you're a woman listening to this, it can it can really uh, work for you as well. Let's say you're a queen warrior magician lover. Um, um, so it can work and it's really good as a woman to understand and read this book so you can have a better understanding of where the men in your life are, whether that's a partner, a brother, a father, um, and which of these archetypes, because that's what they are, um, they showcase more. Now, every one of these archetypes have two sides. And the gentleman of that, the authors really did a good job with a, a graph and I'll put it, put it here and catch this time. Um, so I'm not scrolling through. So they put this graph and I'll have it up on the screen. If you're watching, if you're listening, you can Google this graph. Um, <clears throat> it's not too difficult. I can also put it in the, um, bio below. So there's a different access. So you have your king, your magician, your lover, your warrior access. And then it's pretty much from boy being on the bottom that grows into man and those um, man psychology. So part one is all boy psychology. And one of the quotes that I highlighted here was the adult man does not lose his boyishness in the archetype that form boyhood's foundations do not go away. Um, we all have a kid in us, and some of us are really close to that little boy um, within, and some of us aren't, and we forget that he even exists. And as we forget, he becomes um, annoyed of that and can show up in many ways, which is something that um, they discuss deeply later in the boy. So we have um, <clears throat> the the fully formed and good side you can say and it's really no good or bad but there's like certain ways that you show up in the world and the child that is in his fullness i'm gonna say is considered the divine child so um in the past um it, and there's a christian story is one of the stories they use there's this uh great persian prophet zoroaster z-o-r-o-a-s-t-e-r i hope i'm saying that correctly who pretty much complete was complete with miracles in nature, magic, and, and and he had threats in his life, but he was able to walk through life powerfully. And even though bad things happened, he was able to withstand that and really um, mature in the right way instead of acting out um, in these emotional, non-conducive um, ways of being. So there's a divine child who's the, like the, you can call him the young king. Um, and there's several ways to, uh, or characters in history that have shown that. I don't have those people written down. Um, but when you watch, you just get a sense of who those people are. Um, I would say like Jon Snow in Game of Thrones is probably one of them. Um, as he's young to, to when he's old. I know there's a show coming out for, with him, so I'm, I'm really excited about um about watching that to kind of see and when i watch tv shows i'm always kind of looking at where these people land so the dark side there's two dark sides of a child right um when they are in this king area or like prince they call it the prince so there's the high chair tyrant and then there's the weakling so the high chair tyrant is basically considers himself the center of the universe and everyone and all the other people exist to meet his all powerful needs and desires. I'm going to keep with this game of Thrones analogy. Um, and there was a character and I'm totally blanking on his name. So I'm looking it up. Um, I forgot his name, but he was, he was such an, a little asshole in, <laughs> in that, um, Sorry, I know this is killing some time. Oh man, my phone. Like I'm on this IMDB and it's just like he doesn't show up in the main Miss Top Cast. He's not in the Top Cast, but Oh my 
God. Did you know there was 841 people who worked in this? Crazy. Jesus. He was a Lannister. Where the heck? Let me see. I'm just scrolling right now. I would think he'd be at the top because he was in so many episodes before they killed him. Spoiler alert. Jesus. How about we do this? He was in Atlanta still? I could have sworn he was. Jesus, I'll be here all day. Anyway, I'll cut that out. Anyway, so Game of Thrones had that young boy who ends up becoming a king. He's really the high chair tyrant. Um, he has grandiosity. Um, there's no limit limitlessness to his demands. Um, and he... He can pretty much get whatever he wants, or at least he feels that he has that way, and you can't tell him no. Then there's the other side, the weakling prince. Um, and this is obviously the one who has very little personality, quiet, has no enthusiasm for life, takes very little initiative, hides when things get really difficult, um, and pretty much he plays the victim, uh, which we have a lot of, actually, in this day and age, unfortunately. And for a boy to truly access his divine child, um, which is in his fullness, like removing these two dark sides, right? Um, and allowing this divine child to shine. Um, he needs to have a connection with the other archetypes, which we're going to go into. And he he's able to see that everyone around him is there to support him because he understands, like, he basically has a natural understanding that he is born with what is called the genius um, here. So when you're, if you have a child, it's good to see if you're manifesting these two in your little boy, whether that's the high chair tyrant or the weakling. Um, and you have to see, like, are we manifesting both these? And there's a lot of details that go into each in the book. I'm not going to get into that because that'll be... We'll be here for like six hours. <laughs> and then the second question is, um, where are we honoring the creativity within that child, which is the quote unquote genius that we all have? And are we honoring that um, and allowing that, to ex that boy to express himself in that way? And that can look like anything. So it's good to, to pay attention. Then we go into the other factors. Um, here and you would think this is like the magician of the child is called the precocious child um and this is a boy who who's very eager to learn um he learns relatively quickly and he always wants to share what he is learning which is the magician is they 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 learn things and then they express that and turn show it to the world um, very much a why. So if you, they ask a lot of why questions, right? Like, why do the leaves fall? Why do things have to die? Um, how does this work? How, you know, how was I born? Like all these questions that a, a young, um, child will have is really showing up in their magician. Um, a lot of people consider these children, um, prod child prodigies. Um, they, very curious, have adventurous impulses, so they'll love to try new things. Um, and this shows up in a man who continues to keep that sense of wonder and curiosity alive. And whatever stimulates his intellects and moves him in the direction of a mature ma magician, which 
um, as we get there, you know, I always share my story and I feel like I'm very close to the magician. Then the dark sides of the magician, um, one is called the know-it-all trickster. So it's just like the name apply, implies um, it's immature energy, plays tricks, um, more or less serious um, in their own life and to others. They love to play tricks and, and be this, you know, court gest jester. Um, and this, under the know-it-all, they make a lot of enemies. They're verbally abusive. Um, they can be found at the bottom of the pile of angry boys whacking away at him. That's a quote from the book. And they usually come from those encounters with black eyes, but a uh, conviction of their own superiority. Superiority. Um, usually these are the villains that get beat up as a kid and have a black eye. And they get up and they have a small smirk in their face. Um... Because they just like fucking with people pretty much. But <clears throat> this know-it-all trickster can have a bit of a good side. Because they're the ones that are very good at deflating the ego. They don't take things seriously, right? And usually that's what the core jester will come and do, right? Like entertain. Um, <clears throat> and they usually can spot when someone's too serious. And they'll kind of like, you know, mess with that person in many ways. To deflate that ego or... That seriousness in the in the place, um, so there's that. Then the other side of the dark side is called the dummy. Just as it would, they lack personality, they lack energy, they lack creativity. They seem to be unresponsive and dull. Um, they have a difficult time learning. And this is outside. Like I always say, like when they mind you, this book was written in the '80s, so they say some things that obviously are not okay right now because you don't know right i know one of the pieces they had they can't seem to learn multiplication tables count change or tell time um and frequently are a slow learner i would say it's good to see with a professional first to kind of see what's going on in the brain biologically before you start thinking through um everything else or like these very spiritual um generalizations so just a just a quick note there then you have the autopool child. So this is, a, uh, I believe, um, is this the, the warrior or the lover? And this is the one that's like every man, um, an immature masculine energy has a tie to the mother. Like a very, uh, they put them on a pedestal um, because they are deficient in their experience of nurturing an immature masculine um, when you have a masculine in your life, that's kind of like what you look for. Um, the autopoe child is passionate, has a sense of wonder and deep appreciation for connectedness with it, their inner depths, with others, with other, with all things. So the world, they're very, they're very, they have a sense of wonder of the world. Like everything is beautiful. They're really warm, affectionate. They also express um, through their experience of connectedness with their mother, which is a primary relationship from almost all of us of what we call spirituality. So they have a sense of mystic oneness and mutual communion of all things come out of their deep yearning for the infinitely nurturing, infinitely good and infinitely beautiful mother. It's a lot of poetry in this. Then you have the dark sides to that, right? You have the mama's boy, which we all know. <laughs> um, they often get caught up in chasing beautiful and pognant and yearning for the union with the mother. So that's someone who didn't probably get enough of it or they got too much of it. Um, and they're consistently looking for that. There's a lot of men in this world right now, based on what I've heard with like single friends um, that are women and that are out there dating. A lot of these men showcase this. Right? They are jumping from woman to woman um, and they can't seem to find their person or they can't seem to make commitments um in the book they call it uh don juan syndrome so just something to think about as the mama's boy then you have the dreamer the boy who's possessed by this dreamer um is less than honest and through his dishonesty is usually unconscious they just like go through life with no thought or care of anyone else then you have the hero which is the warrior side of the child so that last one the autopo child was the lover so you have the hero and it's pretty much an advanced form of boy psychology 
probably one of the most advanced based on what they say in the book. Um, and this is a, a boy who's very much um, in the right stage of development or a little ahead of the stage of development. So the hero, it's, you know, the boy who saves the kid getting beat up by bullies or um, things like that, right? They, they have a, a hero personality, which we all see in TV and Marvel movies, right? The dark side of that is the bully. So the person who has the shadow sense has an inflated sense of their own importance and their own abilities. Um, so when confronted with young heroes in the company, he has time to tell them, you boys are good, but you're not as good as you think you are. You will be someday, but you're not now. So they kind of like to try to put people down with their words or physically. Um, they have a denial of death and they feel like they're invincible. And the other side is as the coward. So for obvious reasons, they're the ones who are extremely reluctant to stand up for themselves in physical confrontations. And they usually run away from a fight. So, and I can be honest, I've, I've been there. I've been that person that has run away from fights. Um, when I was a young teenager, early, early ages, but the hero in this is the <clears throat> is pretty much a mature, very independent, they competent, right? Um, they push the envelope. They know that they can't stay in their comfort zones. They're always looking to get better and grow. So they're really showing that maturity. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And this hero enables the boy to begin to assert himself and define himself as distinct from all others so that ultimately a as a distinct being, he can relate to them fully and creatively. And something to note, again, this book was written in the 80s and they say, quote, ours is not an age that wants heroes. Ours is an age of envy in which laziness and self-involvement are the rule. Anyone who tries to shine, who dares to stand above the crowd is dragged back down by his lackluster and self-appointed peers. And that's peers in quotations. And they say, we need a great rebirth of the heroic in our world. Only a massive rebirth of courage in both men and women will rescue the world. Against enormous odds, the hero picks up his sword and charges into the heart of the abyss, into the mouth of the dragon, into the castle under the power of an evil spell. The death of the hero is the death, death in quotations, of boyhood, of boy psychology. And it is... The birth of manhood and man psychology, the quote unquote death of the hero in the life of a boy really means that he has finally encountered his limitations. He has met the enemy and the enemy is himself. He has met his own dark side, his very unheroic side. He has fought the dragon and been burned by it. He has fought the revolution and drunk the dregs of his own inhumanity. He has overcome the mother and then realizing his incapacity to love the princess the quote-unquote death of the hero signals a boy's or man's encounter with the true humility it is the need of his own heroic consciousness and as a boy comes to that understanding in their teenage years or they go through a certain kind of initiation which is something that we're lacking in this environment and if you listen to my previous podcast when i go over books while at heart um, and I went over another one that I'm totally blanking on right now. My coffee is wearing off. <laughs> so with all of that, a man needs some sort of initiation to go into the manhood and which is part two, man psychology. Man psychology is where the boy energies that we just spoke about overlap into man psychology. So the divine child naturally gives us rise to the Oedipal child. Together, they form the nucleus of whatever will be beautiful, energetic, related, warm, caring, and spiritual in the man. The most manly men are both. And this is why my tagline is kind and dangerous. All my social media has that. It's something I live by. It's like I am a very kind person. I've been told um, through friends or, or people that I meet new and they find out that I do things like jujitsu and all these and work out heavily or like they look at my stature and like my body and it looks like someone who won't be fucked with pretty much. 
and that's the dangerous side. But they meet me and they, they sense this soft, nurturing, kind person, right? And I hope that you, you watching this uh, feel that same way because I do want to make sure that people feel safe around me, um, especially women. Uh, yes, I have a partner. I'm not saying it's safe to, to try to do anything, but the, the feminine in, in its entirety, it's all women, can feel safe in my presence. Anyway, so it's very important um, that kind and dangerous. Uh, when a man has that, it's it's a it's I feel like it's a man. Or at least the ones I've studied and looked to, um, they showcase both. So <clears throat> I like this line here that they say in the book is that our egos are like the chair of the board, and the board members are the other archetypes within us. Each needs to be heard from. Each needs to stand on its own and provide its input. But the whole person under the supervision of the ego needs to make the final decision in our lives. So that's the king who needs to make the final decision. So we're going into the the actual title of the book, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. And we start with the king, um, which is very difficult to obtain. And it usually doesn't last for your life. It's not like you become the king once and then you're the king for the rest of your life. Life responsibility, changes in your life, um, letdowns, life throws curveballs at you. All these things will always take you off the pedestal and in a sense, humble you. But so I always say when people think, oh yeah, I, I feel like I'm in my king energy. I'd say, think again. Like I, I'm reading this right now um, because I went over the book yesterday. So I'm going over it right now again because I know I felt like I wasn't in my kingship. Um, for quite a while and it's coming back and I'm working on it, but it's definitely not to that portrayal. And the reason why it comes first, because it's, it's the most important because it includes all the archetypes. It is the archetype that represents balance. Um, it represents that middle of the yin and yang. You are totally immersed in both your masculine and your feminine, not just because this is a book for man, for men and understanding the masculine psyche, the feminine is just as important. So it's a perfect balance of these two. Think about it like this. The good King is also a great warrior, a positive magician and a wonderful lover. And yet most of us, the King comes on the line last. We could say that the King is a divine child, but season complex, wise, and, is, and has a sense of selflessness. As a divine child, it's cosmically, cosmically self-involved. And we see this modern dysfunctional families that have these immature, weak, absent fathers. The king energy has not been sufficiently present. The family is very often given over to disorder and chaos. In my next podcast, I'm doing where I go over a book review it's going to be a boys and men, which I just finished um, last night. And it will dig into this um, a little bit. <clears throat> but the, the, the rise of, of single motherhood, which was beautiful. I grew up in a single mother household. But definitely it affects the family. I've had to do a lot of work um, just to get over the hump and get to a place where I felt comfortable in my own manhood. Because I didn't grow up with... Uh, father in the house, right? Well, I kind of did, but he wasn't always there. Being blessed has tremendous psychological consequences of uh, for us. Now, context here, being blessed by a masculine um, king figure. So as a boy, that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for a man who's in his kingship to give us their blessing. And all it takes is a, is a few words to make us feel valued, praised, blessed, things like that. I'm proud of you, which is like when you see those TV shows, you know, those dramatic ones and the, a character has problems with their dad and the dad gives them that, that praise, right? Or like that blessing, like I'm proud of what you've accomplished so far. We're all looking for that. Even if you're a woman, you're also looking for that. Young men today are starving for a blessing from an older man, right? Instead, they're getting things like get it together when they need to be blessed. 
They need to be seen by the psychological king because if they are, something inside will come together for them. That is the effect of the blessing. It heals and makes whole. And the king ar archetype in his fullness possesses the qualities of order, of reason, of being reasonable and rational, integration, integrity, all of that exists in this masculine psyche. It stabilizes chaotic emotions and out of control behaviors. It gives stability, centeredness, brings calm and it's fertilizing and centeredness. It mediates vitality, life force, and joy. It brings maintenance and balance. It defends our own sense of inner order, our own integrity of being and of purpose. Our own central calmness about who we are and our essential unaccessibility. I think I got that word right. <laughs> and certainty in our masculine identity. It looks upon the world with a firm but kindly eye. It sees others in all their weaknesses and in all their talent and worth. It honors them and promotes them. It guides them and nurtures them toward their own fullness of being. It is not envious because it is secured as the king in its own worth. It rewards and encourages creativity in us and in others. In its central incorporation and expression within the warrior, it represents aggressive might when that is what is needed when order is threatened. It also has the power of inner authority. Kind of dangerous again. It's coming up. This is the energy that encourages his wife when she decides she wants to go back to, to school to become a lawyer. This is the energy that expects itself to a father when he takes time off of work to attend his son's piano recital. This is the energy that through the boss confronts the rebellious subordinates at the office without firing them. And this is the energy that expresses itself through the assembly line foreman when he is able to work with the recovering alcoholic and drug abusers in his charge to support their sobriety and give them empowering masculine guidance and nurturing. Men, that is what you are. You are the guide. And again, in the book of Boys and Men, the, um, he goes over biologically why were fathers even like nature created this idea of a father because the mother has so much, right? They're the ones that give birth. They provide nourishment to the child. And it's just like, what does the father do? Well, we're teachers. We're guides. We're there to support the child and making sure that they're taking the right path, right? Without telling them what they should do is helping them figure it out like a coach. And obviously there are shadow sides to this. You have your tyrant and you have your weakling, um, similar to the princes that we saw in the divine child. Obviously the tyrant, um, as mentioned, you've seen tyrants, um, whether you've read about them, Hitler, or um, you've seen them in TV shows and movies. Um, tyrants, ruthless, merciless, doesn't care for feelings about others, has his own self-interest and makes decisions based on that. He hates beauty. He hates innocence, strength, talent, and just overall life energy. Um, and the man who's possessed by this tyrant and how you can see it is one who is very sensitive to criticism. And though putting on a threatening front will be at the slightest remark, feel weak and deflated. He won't show you this. However, what you will see when you know what to look for is rage in his eyes. But under the rage is a sense of worthlessness. Pay attention, folks. Observe these men. They exist all around us, especially right now. So, and then the, the weakling is very similar. It's just uh, similar to the weakling prince that we spoke about earlier kind of hides. Again, we have a lot of that in this. I didn't even take notes on that because they pretty much just say it's the same, but they just grow up with the similar um, way of being. How to access the king. So we need to achieve what psychologists call cognitive dissonance from the king in both his cognitive distance, sorry, from the king in both his integr integrated fullness and his split bipolar shadow forms. And I love the idea of the integrated human. It's um, It's been something that I've read about. Robert Greene came up with this in his book, Laws of Nature. Um, and it's something that I follow. Like, how do you become an integrated human? And I'll have a whole piece on that. Um, when I have Robert Greene on, which 
Um, it's something that I dream to one day, but, you know, we'll make it happen. Jumping back in. Realistic greatness in adult life as opposed to inflation and grandiosity involves recognizing a proper relationship to this and the other mature masculine energies. That proper relationship is like that of a planet to the star it is orbiting. The planet is not the center of the star system. The star is. The planet's job is to keep the proper orbital distance from the life-giving but also potentially death-dealing star so as to enhance its own life and well-being. Now, there is problems accessing this energy, which arises when we feel that we may have lost effective touch with our life-giving king altogether. In this case, we may fall into the category of a so-called dependent personality disorder, a condition in which we project the king energy within, which we do not experience as within us, onto some external person. We experience ourselves as impotent, as incapable of acting, incapable of feeling calm and stable without the presence and the loving attention of the other, that other person who is carrying our king energy projection. When we are accessing the king correctly, we will feel centered, calm, and hear ourselves speak from an inner authority. We will have the capacity to mirror and bless ourselves and others. We will have the capacity to care for others deeply and genuinely. We will recognize others. We will behold them as a full person as they really are. We will have a sense of being centered, a centered participant in creating a more just, calm, and creative world. We'll have a transpersonal devotion, not only to our families, our friends, our companies, our causes, our religions, but also to the world. We need more kings in this world. There's very few of them. And the ones that do exist are, are probably afraid to, sh to showcase themselves or they just haven't seen themselves in the, in the divine light, as you would say, because so many dark people are uh, taking over leadership positions, unfortunately, because it's what we've created over the last, you know, few decades, right? Moving on to the warrior. This, the warrior, you may think it's a bad thing. But we need warriors. We actually are um, lacking warriors in our current culture. This energy is universally present in us men and in the civilizations we create, defend, and extend. It is a vital ingredient in our world building. And this role extends the benefits of the highest human virtues and cultural achievements to all humanity. A warrior is aggressive and assertive, it, and this is just energetically. So it shows this way through, and it's energized and motivates, and it pushes us to make the offensive, to take the offensive instead of a defensive or holding position about life's tasks and problems. They attack those tasks, they attack those problems without giving it a second thought. So think of it as a samurai. The samurais were one amazing warriors. I read the book Musashi a few years ago. And it's probably one of the best books and best stories I've ever read. Um, and the samurais will always leap into battle with the full potential of their vital energy at their disposal. The Japanese warrior tradition claimed that there is only one position in which to face the battle of life frontally. <laughs> and it's also proclaimed that there was only one direction forward. The warrior is always alert. He's always awake and never sleeping through life. He knows how to focus his mind and his body. And that's not only a way of being alert, like I'm in danger type of thing. It's being alert and understanding the opportunities that present themselves to you. You're not sleeping when you're living your life. You're out there. You're attacking the world in many ways. And they, the warrior really understands the shortness of life and how fragile it is. This is why... I'm a big fan of reading philosophy. A man under the guidance of a warrior knows how few his days are. Rather than depressing him, this awareness leads him an outpouring of life force into an intense experience of his life that is unknown to other. Every act counts. Each deed is done as if it were the last. Very much a uh, stoic philosophy right there. What are you doing now? Right? What? action are you taking now if you continue listening to this but while you're listening to this um take action whatever you need to take action on 
the idea of death energizes the man accessing the warrior energy to take decisive action. This means that he engages life. He never withdraws from it. They have a positive mental attitude, people within the warrior. Um, they have courage, fearlessness. They take responsibility. They have self-discipline. Um, and they give it the story. One of my favorite stories, I've used this so many times in speaking engagements and to clients when I used to coach, but... There's a story of a samurai who was part of a household of a great lord, and his lord had been murdered by a man from a rival house. The samurai sworn vengeance on, this, on his lord's death and tracked the assassin for quite some time. After great personal sacrifice and hardship, after braving many dangers, the samurai found the murderer. He drew his sword to kill the man. But in that instant, the assassin spit in his face. The samurai stepped back, sheathed his sword, and turned and walked away. He walked away. You might be wondering why. He walked away because he was angry that he had been spat on. He would have killed the assassin in that moment out of his own personal anger, not out of his commitment to the ideal his lord represented. His execution of the man would have been out of his ego and in, in his own feelings not out of the warrior within. So in order to be true to his warrior calling, he had to walk away and let the murderer live. The warrior's loyalty then and his sense of duty are to something beyond and other than himself and his own concerns. The hero's loyalty, as we have seen, is really himself to impress himself with others and to impressing others. And there's more to that story because I've heard the full part of that story he allowed the murderer to walk away, finds him again, and in that instant, the, the, the assassin asks him why he didn't kill him the first time, and he says, because I was angry, um, and then kills the assassin. So he does end up succeeding, but it's after he calms himself. And when the warrior is connected to the king, as we said, the king um, encourages the balance of all of them. The man accessing these powers is consciously stewarding the realm and his decisive action. He has clarity in thinking. He has discipline and courage. And in fact, he's creative and generative. And this is why um, he talks about some of the people who had this kind of warrior energy. Marcus Aurelius, Winston Churchill, Musashi, General Patton. Um, and the warrior energy, what I love is that Musashi not only was he a great warrior, he was an artist and a poet. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was a philosopher. Winston Churchill um, was a painter. General Powell was a poet. Like, you know, these warriors understand that there's two sides to being a warrior. There's the aggressive where you know you need to get shit handled. And then, you know, when you can take a step back and enjoy the world. Obviously, the shadow sides to this, um, the sadists and the masochists. And these are people who, you know, are very insecure, violent, not aggressive, rather violent. And they stand against the power of the feminine. And sometimes we may become vulnerable to sadistic warrior, right? Um... This shows up as compulsive personality disorder or workaholics. Um, these people have a tremendous capacity to endure pain. They often manage to get an um, enormous amount of work done. But what is driving their nonstop engine is deep anxiety. It's a desperation of the hero. Any profession that puts a great deal of pressure on a person to perform at his best all the time leaves us vulnerable to shadow systems of the warrior. If we are not secure enough in our own inner structures, we will rely on our performance in the outer world to bolster our self-confidence. And because we need this for the blistering, blistering is so great, I must have messed up that note there, our behavior will gravitate towards compulsion. And the masochist is obviously the pushover, the whipped puppy, and they're angry underneath, but they won't showcase it until it's too much to handle within. If you are a person accessing the warrior appropriately, you will be energetic, decisive, courageous, enduring, 
persevering and loyal to some greater good beyond our own personal gain. At the same time, we need to be leaving the warrior energy with the energy to other mature masculine forms. Moving on to the magician. This is the one that is a master of technology. He is a learner. He is powerful because he understands the, that there's an initiation. Usually um, magicians that are older will be a ritual elder who guides the process of transformation both within and, with, and without to themselves and to others. This archetype also, it, when they're fully embodied, has a bullshit detector. It's set through denial and exercises in discernment. And unfortunately, our age right now, again, written in the 80s, but something that's still coming up of personal and gender identity chaos and chaos is always the result of inadequate accessing of the magician in some vital areas of their life. The magician um, is the archetype of awareness and insight. They also observe the ego. So they're ones that can look at when the ego is showing up too much and say like, ah, I see what you're doing there. Um, it keeps us insulated from the overwhelming power of the other archetypes. It is the mathematician, the engineer. It regulates life functions as, of the psyche as a whole um, because it understands the enormous force be behind these inner dynamics. This is also the person that is very thoughtful, um, reflects, and it can be the energy, energy of introversion. And, you know, it knows how to find those deep inner truths and detach from all the storms that are existing in the world, right? Then there's two shadow sides to this. There's the manipulator and the innocent one. Manipulators obviously maneuver people by withholding information they may need, um, and they charge heavily for little information they do give, which is usually just enough for the magician not to be detached. He is also very cruel. The manipulator not only hurts hurts his uh his hurts himself but hurts others it's obvious he thinks too much and stands back in his life and never truly lives it then you have the innocent one um who's envy of those who act and envious of those who live and want to share he, he just pretty much lives an envious life and if you are accessing the magician, you are um, you have clear sightedness, so you can see into the future. Um, you have a deep understanding and reflection about yourself and possibly about others. And your technical skills are usually out of this world because you understand how to handle your inner psychological forces. This is an energy that needs to be regulated because it helps regulate the other energies. The lover is just as you can imagine. It's the archetype of play, entertainment, and, and display of a healthy embodiment. It understands sensuous pleasure and in one's own body without shame. The lover is deeply sensual, sensually aware and sensitive to the physical world and all its splendor. The lover is related and connected to it all. For the man accessing the lover, all things are bound to each other in mysterious ways. The lover energy is immediate and has intimate contact with this underlying oceanic connectedness. So archetype um, who has a joy of life. It is very empathetic. Um, it understands how to endure pain. It feels the painfulness of being alive, both from himself and others, but sees the beauty in it as well. And majority of the people you see um, who really have a deep access to their lover are artists, musicians, painters, poets, sculptors, writers. Um, they really know how to dig into their um, inner lover. Obviously, there's dark sides to this. Um, there's the addict, which, you know, showcases and those exist a lot, especially in the art world. A lot of people are addicted to drugs, drinking, things like that. Um, that's showing the shadow side of this. They get lost in the ocean of the senses, not just in sunsets or revere. So I'm running out of time. So I'm trying to get through this fast. So that's the addict. 
And then there's the victim side. There's the man who's always searching for something, doesn't know what he wants. He's the cowboy at the end of the movie, riding off alone into the sunset, seeking some other excitement, some other re- or adventure, unable to settle down. Oof. And we can also, it wasn't the the victim, sorry. It was called the impotent lover. We feel that there's always something better. We lack enthusiasm, lack vividness, lack aliveness. We feel a flat effect. If you're accessing the lover, you have a deep sense of meaning, um, which is called spirituality. And it's this, the lover who has a source of longing for a better world and for uh, for us and others. He's the idealist and the dreamer. He's the one who wants to have an abundance of good things. And the lover keeps the other masculine energies humane, loving, and related to each other in the real life situation of human beings struggling in a difficult world. So that's your king, warrior, magician, lover. And then there's one quote I will close with. Perfect timing. Let us nurture and welcome great individuals, individual men who will, and with the benevolence of ancient kings, the courage and decisiveness of ancient warriors, the wisdom of magicians and the passion of lovers, more energetically to take up the challenge of saving a world that has been cast down before us. There are certainly global needs and work enough to keep every man busy for the foreseeable future. And it's, it's beautiful, a beautiful book, very poetic, um, a great guide and if it's great if you have a son or a young one to read this together um i hope this recording this podcast can probably assist you in understanding a lot of what they talk about because there's a lot of metaphors and things like that but all of us men we want to be needed we want to work on something. And unfortunately, what I've read recently in the, of Boys and Men, again, which I will go over in the next podcast, is that men are taking a backseat in education, in the workforce, and in other, in other areas. And it's not, it's mostly because of what we created as a society and culture over the last few years, which has been great on one side, and we've ignored one side of the spectrum. It takes both of us. It takes women. It takes men to make the world move forward. You know, we've been wrong a lot. We've made a lot of mistakes as a humankind. We've created great things. We've created a great world. Yes, we're going through a lot of pain right now. War, inflation, the economy is down as of this recording, which is uh, Thursday, October 13th and US of A. But... There's so much more we can do when we, as men, I'm talking to men here, access the king. And in order to access the king, you need to access your inner magician, your inner lover, your inner warrior. You need to go out there and attack the world. You need to bring your gifts as a magician. You need to showcase that love, be empathetic to those you care and love for and those you work with. And your clients, your customers, whoever you work alongside and support in your day-to-day. There's a lot of work to be done, folks. Um, And I hope that this podcast will help people think through and what they are thinking when it comes to this book and everything I talked about today. I'm curious to hear what's on your mind. Feel free using the links below to reach out to me um, on Twitter, on Instagram, whichever platform you feel most comfortable with. Um, And I hope to continue this conversation. All right. I'm jumping off, y'all. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, please subscribe, follow the podcast, check us out on YouTube so you can see the video version of this. Um, And yes, stay connected and much love. Hope you have a great rest of your week, y'all. Take care.